anisotropic materials. In this video, we'll talk qualitatively about anisotropy, and I will try to give you an intuitive feel of why and how materials can be anisotropic and what does that mean? How can that even happen? And then we'll get into how we quantify that. Let's start with an analogy of anisotropic displacement. So we know at the atomic scale, we're pushing charges around and somehow charges are more easily displaced in some directions than other. And that seems kind of weird and magical. And I love this analogy. Let's say we have a sliding glass door and we're making an analogy here to charges at the atomic scale. And this sliding glass door is clearly more free to move in some directions than other. Maybe I shouldn't have said some directions. It's free to move in only one direction. Uh, it will move you know, a millimeter or so in and out of the screen or a millimeter or more up and down. But for the most part, it is very free to move left and right. So let's say we apply a force to this door. And we're applying a force, yeah, let's call it a 45 degree angle. We're not pushing straight into the door and we're not pushing straight along the direction that we know it'll move. We're pushing at a 45 degree angle. What happens? What direction does that door displace? Well, the door displaces left to right. It may move into the screen, you know, a millimeter or maybe up a half a millimeter or something almost negligible. For the most part, it is moving left and right. That happens because the, the door itself is simply more free to move left and right. It's on rails. It can't move in and out of the screen or up and down. And this is very analogous of what's happening at the atomic scale. Let's talk about what's happening at the atomic scale now. So the anisotropic Lorentz model. We've been thinking about an atom and having this electron cloud around it and making this analogy with a mass on a spring. Well, we have an animation here showing our nucleus, which has a positive charge. We have this electron cloud around it and the blue arrow is an applied electric field. And I'm showing three springs here. And what you can see is sort of a real weak spring where this, this cloud is very able to displace. Uh, a slightly stronger spring with slightly uh, less able to displace charge along this direction, and then a very thick and robust spring, which does not provide uh, very much displacement in the vertical direction at all. And so I'm wiggling around the direction of this electric field, and you can watch this electron cloud displace more in some directions than others. So remember the electric susceptibility really was our measure of how easily polarized a material could be to an applied electric field. But if the displacement can be in a different direction, so our polarization can be in a different direction in the electric field, that makes our susceptibility a tensor quantity. And it's a nine element tensor. And what this essentially means, and if we know how to multiply matrices and column vectors, we know that the X component of the polarization will be this times the X, this term times EY and this term times EZ. And the way to interpret that is information from X, Y, and Z can leak into the X component of polarization. Likewise, X, Y, and Z of E can somehow affect the Y component of polarization and X, Y, and Z can affect the Z component of polarization. So in general, the electric field can polarize a material in a direction other than the, the, the direction the electric field is pointing. And that is simply because the charges are more free to move in some directions than other. On the left, I'm showing a, a crystal, a little piece of a crystal. But what we can see with this sort of atomic scale picture is this, this clearly looks different in this direction, than in this direction, than in this direction. And so it does make some intuitive sense that charges are just going to be more easily pushed in some directions than others. So let's look at this animation I have at the upper right. This first animation is showing a direction where the susceptibility is high. So if we apply an electric field that easily displaces that electron cloud in that direction. The second case is showing that left or right, when I apply an electric field, it's more difficult to displace those electric charges, the electron cloud, if you will. And then the third case, well, what if this electric field is applied at a 45 degree angle? 
Well, if it's the same atom as those first two cases, then the displacement will not be in the direction of the electric field. And that's because it's displacing more vertically than it is horizontally. And so the only way we can describe this is using a tensor. The susceptibility becomes a tensor quantity. Let's get into the quantitative description of anisotropy. So we've already mentioned most fundamentally, it is the susceptibility that is the tensor quantity. However, when we specify materials, we almost always specify materials through its permittivity or its dielectric constant. And so if the susceptibility is a tensor, well, the permittivity also becomes a tensor. So we have our susceptibility tensor. And if we just simply add the identity matrix to that, we get our relative permittivity tensor or a dielectric constant tensor. And so we have our constitutive relation D equals epsilon E, but our permittivity is now a tensor. So this is our dielectric constant tensor or our relative permittivity tensor. And so it'd be much more common to see this actually than susceptibility, even though susceptibility is the more fundamental thing. We'll mention that there's some symmetry conditions that have to exist in here. And so this says that we have Hermitian symmetry. That means essentially numbers across the diagonal. So we have our center diagonal. And like, for example, these two numbers are symmetric about the diagonal. Uh, these two numbers are symmetric about the diagonal. These two numbers are symmetric about the diagonal. And what they're saying is that they're complex conjugates of each other. So we have these symmetry conditions because we only live in a three-dimensional world. In fact, in this tensor, there's only three degrees of freedom. We can only choose three numbers, but we get nine numbers because sometimes we're analyzing a material system where these principal directions that charges displace, and we only have three because we live in a three-dimensional world. If we rotate that relative to the coordinate system we're analyzing it in, suddenly we get nine numbers here. Uh, but, but because there's only three degrees of freedom, we have these rules, and that's that's where that comes from. So it'll turn out that all atoms will have these certain principal directions. And these are the, the, the main key directions that we can displace charge in. Of course, we can displace charge in any directions, but there's three principal directions. And we'll call that A, B, and C instead of X, Y, and Z, because these principal directions don't have to be perpendicular to each other. They don't have to be Cartesian like we think with X, Y, and Z. And if you want some examples of that, if you've ever gone to a museum and looked at some crystals, and you'll notice they're not cubes, sometimes they're oblique. And so these directions aren't necessarily perpendicular to each other. So we'll call them A, B, and C. So if we look at these tensor quantities, whether it's susceptibility or in this case, permittivity, if we look at it in its natural system, we get a diagonal tensor and we can see the three specific values. We only get numbers in these off diagonal positions when we're looking at this tensor in a coordinate system other than A, B, and C, other than its natural directions. So that's what we'll call the principal axes. So if we have Maxwell's equation with the anisotropic materials, Notice Maxwell's equations themselves remain unchanged, and that's because the material properties don't appear in Maxwell's equations. They appear in the constitutive relations. So our constitutive relations also look very similar, except we've drawn these square brackets around mu and epsilon, and that is simply to remind us that these quantities are now tensors. And that's because charges can displace in some directions more easily than others, which means we have a different value of permittivity in some directions than others. Anisotropy comes in three different flavors. We have isotropic materials, and these are our cubic. So we have simple cubic, body center cubic, face center cubic. And if we were to write a tensor for an isotropic material, what we see is that we have all the same value running down the diagonal. And in this case, it's sort of a waste to write this as a tensor. We can just write this as a scalar. And in fact, that's what's done almost exclusively throughout electromagnetics because it's rare to see anisotropy analyzed. We also have uniaxial symmetries. That happens when two of our natural directions have the same permittivity, but the third has something different. 
So that's uniaxial. And if the, the unique direction, we'll call that the extraordinary axis. So if the extraordinary permittivity is greater than the ordinary permittivity, the ordinary being the two that are the same, we call that positive birefringence. If the extraordinary permittivity is less than the, the ordinary permittivity, we call that negative birefringence. And then the most general case, the biaxial case, that's where all three permittivities are different. And it's convention to have uh, EC be the largest value, EB be the moderate value, and EA be the lowest value. However, if you actually have taken your crystal and oriented in some weird way, you wouldn't want to do this. We would just use this order if we're just specifying a material. But if you're analyzing a device, you absolutely must put the correct permittivities in the correct orientation. I am not really going to spend a lot of time on this slide. I just wanted to put some materials out there and that are isotropic, uniaxial, biaxial, and give you an idea of the numbers that we can get from real materials. And of course, if we ever wanted more extreme values, we have to look at metamaterials and periodic structures, which of course is a, is a topic later on. So I won't discuss this, but feel free to pause the video and look at these numbers.